members, thank you for getting right over here after floor session ended. I will call this meeting of the Senate Housing and Homelessness Prevention Committee to order. Uh, members, we have five bills today. Um, I would like to try to get through all of them if possible. For members' knowledge, uh, these bills are all being referred to judiciary, but then will be coming back to housing um, after their stop in judiciary. Senator Dreheim. Uh, and maybe I could address it when we get to some of the bills, but it looks like some of the bills need more than one stop other than judiciary, and I can talk to you that at, offline if, if you want. Thank you. Um, let's go ahead and start with the first bill, uh, Senator Paz, Senate File 3979. Welcome to the committee table, Senator Pa. Please uh, go ahead and present your bill. Thank you, Chair Port and members. Thank you for the opportunity to present my bill, which is SF 3979, which will expand existing statute prohibiting landlords from restricting a tenant's right to seek emergency assistance to include mental health crisis. I want to first thank Senator Draham for being a co-author on this bill. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we want to make sure that people who are struggling with their mental health can ask for help. And one phone call, one connection to supportive services can make all the difference. And it shouldn't be, uh, they shouldn't be penalized for seeking help. So recently, as you may have seen in the news, the city of Anoka, city officials, had used a prohibition against nuisance emergency calls to, as a way to discriminate against people who called 911 because they were experiencing mental health crisis. And so this is something we don't wanna see happen in our communities. And we don't want cities or landlords to retaliate against tenants or people who are seeking help when they need it. I do have a, te a testifier with me today, Madam Chair, and whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I want you to imagine that you have a child with a serious mental illness, they are in crisis, and you call 911. The police come to your apartment and are helpful. Over the next few months, your child is in crisis several times and you call 911 again. And then one day you open your mail and you see that you are being asked to leave your apartment because there have been too many 911 calls. This is just one of several scenarios that we have heard over the past couple of years. But it was the city of Anoka's actions which the Department of Justice found violated several federal laws that instigated this bill. The city police department um, shared information that they obtained when they did a 911 call response uh, to someone with a mental illness. And they shared information about that person's mental illness um, and their medications with landlords and encouraged the landlords to evict them. No one ever should feel afraid to call 911 in a health or a mental health crisis. No one ever experiencing a health or mental health crisis should feel afraid to call for help because they could lose their housing. We had thought that the phrase and any other contact included health and mental health, um, but clearly the city of Anoka did not read it that way. So this bill simply clarifies that under current law that you can't penalize someone for calling 911 for a health or mental health emerg emergency. We don't need any more people with a mental illness becoming homeless. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Everhold. Uh, members, questions? Senator Dreheim. No, I, I just wanted to support the bill and um, a wonderful idea uh, to, to help people that uh, might be struggling and, and why should they be penalized? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a common um, misconception for, for some landlords um, to not understand the full picture and especially for some maybe the bigger operators that have a lot of tenants to kind of watch over. Um, so I, I think this is a step in the right direction, and I thank the author. Thank you. Members? 
Senator Pye, would you like to move your bill? Yes, so I would like, can, uh, can we ask for a green vote on this one or is it gonna be lead over? Okay, so uh, Chair Port, I would like to ask for your support and the committee member support uh, for a green vote on this bill. Thank you. Senator Pa moves that Senate File 3979 be recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Senator Pa, your bill is on its way to judiciary. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Senator Bolden, Senate File 2448. Welcome, Senator Bolden. Uh, I believe you have an author's amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do, and I actually have an amendment to the author's amendment that I would like to incorporate into the A. I would like to incorporate the A3 into the A1. I'll just say both of, uh, for members' knowledge, both of those reflect um, conversations with stakeholders and sort of some technical changes to the language. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think it's the H A3 onto the A2. I have the A3 onto the A1, but she has the A1. Okay. Madam Chair, that's correct. The A3 onto the A2. Okay, so members, we will first take a vote uh, to amend the A3 onto the A2. Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The A3 is amended onto the A2. And now the A2 as amended. Members, any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The A2 is amended onto your bill. Senator, Senator Bolden, 22448 as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, this is a bill um, to give tenants, uh, to empower tenants to be able to communicate clearly with their landlords in cases where they have repairs that are needed in their uh, living spaces. Um, I will get to some uh, pictures here in a moment, as a picture is worth a thousand words, but um, I ask folks to, uh, committee members, to imagine uh, what it would be like uh, in your living space if, for instance, you didn't have flooring in your bathroom or in your kitchen, or if you had persistent repair issues uh, that were not being repaired. Uh, this is happening uh, for many Minnesotans. Uh, I'll also note, um, you know, this uh, offers uh, an opportunity of uh, just clear communication for tenants to communicate to landlords that they have an item that needs repair in their unit, requesting for that to be repaired. Uh, it would provide a two week, 14 day window for the landlord to uh, respond and repair it. Um, so, you know, offering uh, ample time uh, for that communication and for that to be completed. Uh, so this is not aiming to um, to impact the responsible landlords who are in communication with their tenants and taking care of repairs as they should be. It really is aimed at remedying the issue that we are seeing uh, of landlords who are not doing that and are not responding to tenants' needs and are not providing um, the, the work that needs to be done to have safe living spaces for tenants. And so I, I will note that it isn't solely um, the case, but often the case for large corporate landlords who are perhaps out of state, um, who are just unresponsive and are un, unwilling um, to, to make such repairs. And so um, I'll uh, just um, show a couple of photos here as have been in the news uh, within the last year. Uh, a note here um, at the East Village apartment, uh, they had a, there was a flood. Um, and so these are uh, pic photos from some of those uh, units in that apartment building. So this was uh, a space cut out of a ceiling uh, in what was, I believe, a kitchen. Uh, kitchen, kitchen without a fl flooring. Another picture without flooring. Bathroom without flooring. And these photos were taken months after the initial event. It wasn't a short period of time. This was months later that this had not been repaired, despite the tenants asking and, and having notified the landlords of this. 
Uh, a second uh, incidence of this was reported in the Minnesota Reformer in Minneapolis, uh, where there was rain damage. So you can see mold on the ceiling here. Uh, ceiling again, water damage. Uh, so just some examples of what this might look like. I will say this is not intended for emergencies. There is a process that we strengthened last session. And so emergencies uh, would go through that process. This is intended for non-emergencies. Uh, so the process would be the tenant would notify, and there's specifications in the bill around how they need to give that notification um, to the landlord of what needs to be repaired. Uh, and if nothing, um, uh, if there's no response within that two weeks, then the tenant has the right to seek uh, bids. Uh, they need to get at least two bids, and then they have to use the uh, less expensive one of those two bids, can have the item repaired, submit the uh, receipt, so there has to be proof that they have paid that bill to the landlord, and then they can deduct that amount from their future rent up to a cap of two months' rent worth. Um, so I'm happy uh, to take questions, uh, members, and look forward to further discussion. Uh, thank you, Senator Bolden. I do have one person signed up for testimony, so we'll go ahead and do that first. Uh, Cecil Smith. Mr. Smith, welcome to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself for your, the record and provide your testimony. And uh, for members of the public, we are asking folks to keep their testimony to two minutes today because we have quite a full schedule. Uh, Mr. Smith. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Cecil Smith. I'm the President and CEO of the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association. MHA is an industry nonprofit representing 2,100 members with over 300,000 rental units serving over 600,000 residents in Minnesota. Before I begin my testimony, I want to acknowledge the loss of one of our team members uh, this week. We had a caretaker who was killed in the management office uh, in a brutal homicide. Oh and um, it's something that hits personally for me because my wife works in our management office and uh, we're there to serve our residents. But it can be dangerous sometimes and tragically uh, the situation happened in Brooklyn Park, and uh, we're mourning with our member company and their team members that lost their colleague. Today, I'm here to respectfully express MHA's opposition to Senate File 2448. The bill looks to provide an alternative method for repair issues on a property. We believe this is an unnecessary addition to state statute as remedies for these already exist that are well known and accessible. These remedies include calling the local housing inspector or city, filing a rent escrow case, a tenant remedies action, or an emergency tenant remedies action, which was expanded last session and has only been effective since January 1st. Under the TRA or ETRA actions, the court can order the housing provider to make the repair, appoint an administrator, uh, engage in rent abatement, court ordered repairs, and deduct, uh, and any other relief deemed just and proper. This proposal as drafted does not provide that the repair professional needs to be licensed, bonded, or insured. This is a huge concern as liability for damages from a faulty repair on a multi-million dollar property can be expensive and disruptive. The proposal does not provide a remedy if a resident is non-compliant with the requirements of the statute. As such, if they do not use a professional to perform the repair, uh, they provide improper notice or they create a new liability due to an improper repair. Additionally, it appears to allow that a resident or their guest who creates the need for repair are eligible to use this provision at the expense of the housing provider. I'm further concerned about the lack of limitations on the repairs and a process which can be bypassed by the resident for an emergency purpose or when a timeline is provided by a housing official which they do not agree with. Please wrap up your testimony, sure. Mr. Smith. Finally. As a business, we have regulations we must follow, such as the IRS and Minnesota Department of Revenue to file 1099 on goods and services over $600. This is unlikely that something a resident will be knowledgeable of and need to provide. Thank you, Madam, and members of the committee for the opportunity to share our concerns. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Members, questions? Senator Dreheim. Thank you, and thank you for bringing the bill forward. Um, obviously, you're trying to solve a problem that Things are taking too long to get repaired, and you know, as we all know, the uh, trades industry has been very busy, and uh, 
we're lacking people in the trades. We, we don't have people filling the gap for those that are retired. Um, and, and we've had bills to, I've had bills to try to address that for years that unfortunately haven't uh, made it across the finish line. Um, but I, I think Mr. Smith touched on a couple things I wanted to bring up. You know, with some of the properties I had over the years, um, we always tried to have everything 100%. And I know some landlords, housing providers don't do that. But I think the majority do. And I just kind of running across some of the scenarios I think there'd be a problem with. And one was mentioned with the tax filings that we, we have to do. And um, we had problems sometimes in the trades getting that tax form back so we could file our taxes. Um, most of us have a relationship with contractors and we use those contractors because we've had a good experience with them and um, we trust their judgment. And, and I could see a, a bill maybe not getting paid over a dispute and then a lien come on the property. I could see um, faulty repairs done. I, I think this is a big can of worms that I, I, members, I, I think we need to get vetted a little bit better if we're gonna move forward with something like this. Um, what is a repair? So you get a notice and there's a, uh, uh, a crack in the Formica countertop and they get two estimates. And, um, you know, maybe it's a Corian top or, or some other uh, Cambria countertop. I mean, could they just go ahead and put in, uh, you know, a, a Corian countertop? I mean, they've got two estimates. I mean, wh where, where do you draw the line? And, and then how do you dictate what they're going to put in? And um, flooring, you know, I've, I've replaced a lot of flooring in, in my house over the last couple of years. There is quite a, a variable in quality and cost. And you have to know what you're doing when you're putting flooring in. Um, you have to prepare the surface. So um, Senator Lucero, as a housing provider, if, if he's going to have someone put flooring in, he's probably going to make sure they're doing it right. Probably even stop in and check on them as they're doing it, uh, if he doesn't do it himself. But under this bill, the way it's drafted, you'd have no control over how the repairs are done as an owner, but you would be fiscally responsible for that, and then the liability for others. Um, my mom had a new house built for her because of her allergies. So she lived in a newer home. She had to keep a window open every day of the year. There's a, uh, a news article on it. You could watch it on YouTube, I'm sure. Uh, she had a different house built for her because of her allergies. When you don't have a control over what's being done, um, a lot of times you can't control the contractor's use if it is a contractor, because I don't really see anything in here about being a contractor or not, or licensed in Minnesota, but what products are you using to put in there? And if you had a rental property that maybe someday you were gonna turn over to one of your kids or um, a family member, and they had a, the allergy issues that my mom has and my sister has, where they're allergic to everything, they'd want to make sure there are certain products used when remodeling that. Under this bill, you'd have no control over that. Um, so I, I appreciate the concept. I know you're trying to get at underlying problem that tenants are waiting too long to get things repaired. Um, you know, I, I, I do think there are a lot of cities that do a good job of um, policing some of the bad housing providers out there. Um, so I, I would suggest that we need to work with uh, the different communities and uh, try to nip out the bad operators rather than put a blanket on every unit across the state that I think is just going to open up more can of worms, make housing more expensive, and cost more for the people that really can't afford it. So thank you, Chair.
Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator uh, Bolden. I think we agree that unresponsive or non-responsive housing providers that neglect their properties, neglect their tenants, that results in challenges to living or safety concerns for living is definitely a serious problem. And I appreciate the, the attempts to, to bring a proposal anyway to have a conversation on that topic. But again, uh, I have concerns and I, uh, some of my questions were the same concerns that Senator Dreheim had. Uh, but so I just, I'll have just a, a handful of questions here. The first would be, is there a scope of what types of repairs? Because in the universe of repairs that could occur, uh, do you have it narrowed down to just certain types of repairs? Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Lucero, for the question. Uh, there is not a, a list of items that is included in this bill um, as a list of repairs. We had conversation about that, and I'm open to continued conversation about that. As I mentioned, emergencies are not part of this. Um, but beyond that, uh, the concern with um, you know having a list is it's really hard to make an exhaustive list, um, uh, and you know we want it. I want it to be. Uh, inclusive of the repairs, you know, that are needed uh, to keep the space, uh, you know, safe and livable. Um, so it, it is sort of intentionally broad for that reason, um, but open to continued conversation about that. Senator Lucero. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Bolton. Okay, so so any repair, right? So the definition of repair, then it sounds like it's pretty pretty subjective, and and just thinking some of the experiences that I've had. So uh, in, a, in a scenario, could a, a tenant take a hot pot, fresh off the stove, put it onto a laminate countertop, burn the laminate countertop, and then that would qualify for a repair under the scope of this bill? Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Uh, uh, if it is, uh, you know, damaged to the point that it needs to be repaired, then I would say potentially yes. Senator Lucero. Okay, and then in that scenario, as Senator Drahan brought up, if the current countertop is laminate, and therefore obviously more subject to, to being burned by a hot pot, could the two estimates that come in be a quartz and a granite countertop? Senator Bolden. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Um, so the, the bids could be uh, for a number of things. I, I will take this opportunity to, to push back a little bit on uh, Senator Dreheim's comments about lack of control. I would argue that the landlord has complete control because they have two weeks to take care of this themselves um, and, and to have that communication with the tenant and to, to take complete control of bids they want to get and how they want to repair it. So they have com complete control over how they would like to replace that. It's in the case if they ignore the tenant and do nothing for the next two weeks, then they're, then the tenant would have the, uh, the right to get it repaired um, and, and then still would get those uh, two quotes and have to use the less expensive of the two. Okay. Senator Dreheim. Sorry. So in the countertop example, so, you know, my first thought was when you brought up the bill and, and I looked at the first version of it. I haven't really studied as much this second or third version, but um, was it was for things that stop them from using the unit. So in Senator Lucero's example of the countertop, you know, if they have a burn mark on the countertop, they can still enjoy their, their, their unit. And, you know, I, I think just having put in new countertops and, and part of my house, it, it took weeks to get countertops. Um, so if, uh, under the example that we were, were talking about with countertops, is there anything in the bill that would limit it to just the functionality of an apartment, or is it something cosmetic? So a hole in the wall or a hole in the door would that, would that be something that you would expect somebody to do in two weeks? And then what if the second part of that question, Chair, I'm sorry, I'll try to keep it short, would be what if it takes longer in two weeks to get the product? I mean, you know, two years ago we were waiting six, eight, nine months for common items. So if you're trying to match a countertop or a, a faucet or something that is just not, still functions but maybe not, cosmetically cracked, um, is that included? 
Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, mean, I would say if there's a, a hole in the wall or a hole in the door, that's a repair that I would think would need would should be repaired. I mean, I don't think you want to live with a hole in your wall. Um, you know, tenants should have uh, you know repairs made as needed. In terms of the timeline of you know getting materials, I mean that can be difficult. And you mentioned before, sort of you know workforce shortage, and that's that's a real thing. Um, what I would say about that is, if a tenant is able to get. Um, you know, bids and uh, workers to come in, then a landlord would also be able to get tenants and landlord or, uh, workers and co contractors to come in. Senator Lucero, did you? Thank, thank you. I have uh, probably about 10 more questions on this bill. So the, uh, the scenario, back to my, my, if the existing is laminate and the two bids that come in are quartz and granite, I just want to confirm there is no prohibition about the lowest of those two bids being used to replace the, the laminate countertop of which the damage was caused by the neglect and, and poor choices of the tenant themselves. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would say, again, I'm happy to have further conversation about this, but uh, currently- uh, under, under the bill as, as written. Yes, that's, uh, if a repair needs to be made, Again, there's that two-week window where the landlord can and should have communication and has the ability to intervene. If that does not happen within a two-week period, then yes, the, the tenant has the right to get two bids and use the lower of the two. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so then uh, you speak about the two weeks. So that's two weeks for the repair to be made as, I, as I'm reading the language correctly. Uh, can you, okay, and I heard something out, so I'll save a little bit of time there. Okay, so that means, uh, in the case of a laminate countertop, if, if the, the landlord is aware, communication is there, but the, the part can't come in or a color match can't come in. Apologies, could you repeat the last so, part of that? Yep, no, no worries. Uh, if, a, if, a, if it takes greater than two weeks for a material to arrive, or to line up a contract with the contractor schedule in the, the heat of the building season, uh, then the, the, the tenant is just gonna be able to proceed. That's a problem. There's a whole host of scenarios, whether it be siding. You know, I could imagine vinyl siding there and a branch falls down and creates a, a, a golf ball size hole in the vinyl siding. And since there's no limitations here, the tenant could go out then and get bids for cement board siding, for uh, hardy back siding, or you know some, and and replace then, and may not even color match. I mean, there's a whole host of issues that can arise from this. Another scenario would be, uh, I know during COVID there was a a number of stories where tenants were doing unauthorized things. So what if, unbeknownst to a housing provider, a tenant brings in an animal unauthorized and soils the carpet such that the carpet now needs to be repaired, and uh, the there is a dispute between the two on who's gonna pay for what, and the tenant then goes out on their own and has that carpet replaced with laminate flooring or hardwood flooring. There's nothing in here that I see that requires like for like, color, there's no controls. This, this is gonna create a huge mess. The next question I would have off of the, the type of work would be, I see on the amendment as amended on line 1.11, it says the address where the tenant sends rent. What if tenants aren't sending rent? They're using other methods of payment like electronic. Senator Bolton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would anticipate, I'm happy to add further language, that I would anticipate the, uh, it would be the contact information that the tenant has for the landlord. Senator Lucero. That's what I would hope, but that's not what it says. That's not what you as the, as the chief author put on this piece of paper that's before us. And I would hope that you would have, have envisioned or thought about this before we had the, the committee hearing. The next I see on the next line is 1.12 to call or send an email. I see nothing in here that the, uh, about having to make affirmative contact. Does calling, letting it ring once, hanging up, does that constitute having called? I don't see a requirement to leave a voicemail. I don't see anything in there. Sending an email. I have done it many times, I'm sure every one of us does or has, we send an email, we unfortunately change one letter and the email never arrives at its destination. In good faith we sent an email, would that qualify here? The, the tenant sent an email, or they thought they did, but it was an inaccurate email, misspelled by one letter. Does that now constitute? 
I don't see any language in here that says that there's affirmative receipt of that email or some kind of confirmation of notification is absent from this. Uh, just a handful more questions. The next question is, would a contractor then have the right to subject the property to a contractor's lien in this scenario? Senator Bolden. Uh, Senator Lucero, can you repeat that question, please? Senator Lucero. Would a contractor be able or have the right to subject the property, to place a lien against the property, a contractor's lien on the property? Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would say at this point, uh, I believe the answer to that would be yes. Senator Lucero. Wow, I, I don't think you understand then what you're subjecting uh, property and owners of property to. If a tenant can authorize work, unbeknownst to the owner of the property, that would allow a contractor to place a contractor's lien on somebody else's property. I don't think you, you've grasped what's happening here. Uh, and that, Again, that's gonna be a giant mess. Uh, because that's going to create liability up and down. Uh, and then I'll just I'll finish up with this last question. What happens if the work is faulty? I don't see in here that the contractor has to be licensed. There's a whole host of types of, you know, plumbing requires license, electrical work needs a license. Uh, there's a, a whole host of work that must require a licensed uh, contractor. I don't see in here that the contractor has to be licensed. And so what happens if there's liability? What if a contractor, it looks like your definition is who routinely repair and specialize in making the type of repair. Well, what does that mean? So, I mean, somebody can routinely specialize in making repairs, but they're still not licensed. They're doing so illegally, but yet routinely. Uh, somebody can come in, perform some electrical or plumbing work. Uh, what, what if it's a second or third story, they're doing some plumbing, they change something, it creates a leak. Now you've got plumbing leak to the next uh, couple floors down, which might impact other tenants. Who's liable for that? Is it the tenant? Is it the contractor? The owner didn't authorize the contractor. This is a giant uh, can of worms that you're opening up here. And I really hope there's some serious reconsideration before this uh, were to ever be considered even prime time for uh, consideration. Thank you. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Lucero. Uh, there's a lot of questions there. I will uh, address some of them. The, to the last point about liability, I would point members to line 2.14. Um, contractors are liable to the landlord for damages made to the apartment during repairs. Um, to the question about the email contact, um, so the you know it's required that they uh, either call or send an email communication to the landlord. So if if someone sends an email to the wrong email address, that's not sending an email to the landlord. So they would have to actually send the email to the landlord. Um, I want to sort of refocus us on the issue here and remind us that. Uh, the landlords have two weeks to take care of these issues. It doesn't have to go to this extent. This really is aiming to get at the problem where they are ghosting the tenants, and it is happening. Um, I'll note uh, on line 1.25, um, so it states if the landlord has not provided the tenant with a scheduled repair date uh, within 14 days. So not that the repair needs to occur within 14 days, but it needs to be scheduled within 14 days. Um, two weeks is a long time, members, for landlords to get in contact with tenants and take care of these repairs. Uh, and uh, tenants have the right to have uh, spaces that are safe um, and and repaired. And so this really is um, aiming to, to get at that problem and offer uh, a process for to empower tenants uh, who are currently um, you know, living in spaces uh, with repairs and they are not getting response from landlords for months in some cases. Senator Dreheim. Thank you. And, and then the other thing I, I don't think we've really talked about, and I'm sure there's more, if we're gonna move forward with this idea, and I understand the importance of trying to find a solution, um, I just don't think this bill is it, um, is the permitting. And, and a lot of communities are um, not real speedy on permits too. So I don't know if there's anything in here that I missed that talks or references any uh, permits from any local entity um, in the time frame, or, you know, th there's usually a fees that go with that. Um, uh, in a lot of cases where they, they want to come in and inspect because it is a multi-family unit. Um, so something to think about. 
Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Drayham. There's nothing currently in the language about uh, permits. Happy to continue that conversation. I would say, um, again, that it, there's that two-week window that the landlord could take care of that um, and that, that it needs to be scheduled within that two-week period, understanding that the, the, the entire process may take longer than that. Senator Zhang. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Bolden. Thank you so much for bringing this bill, uh, working with many clients before uh, that had to bring uh, rent escrows against their landlords. And I've seen clients with uh, months of disrepair. Uh, you know, it, you know, there, there, there are remedies for emergency repairs, but, you know, certain things just stack up, right, that the landlord just doesn't respond to. Um, and I think that what, what's um, important here that there is there is already the 14-day notice that's given to the landlord. Um, and if they fail to do that, I think this is uh, one way to help uh, push that along and to get these re needed repairs uh, taken and uh, look forward to supporting your bill. Senator Bolden, any closing comments? Uh, thank you, members, for the good discussion, um, and I look forward to future discussion on this. I, you know, in a perfect world, this would not be necessary, and if enacted, it would never even be used. But we know that there is a need for it, that uh, there are folks, uh, Minnesotans across the state, who are living in conditions uh, that none of us would want to live in, and they are not getting response from their landlord. And so, um, you know, we have a responsibility to, to make that better, and, and we have the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Uh, and Senator Bolden would like to move her bill. I would, Madam Chair. I would move that Senate file 2448 as amended be recommended to pass and re referred to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The ayes have it. Your bill is on the way to Judiciary. Senator Bolden. Um, members, we have uh, a change in the agenda to accommodate uh, some of the testifiers. We're just gonna switch the next two bills around. So it'll be 3492 first and then 4015. Right. Uh, so Senator Mohammed, Senate file 3492. Madam Chair, we have some technical, we need some te technical help to connect. Senator Mohammed, while they are working on getting your technical uh, thing switched around, do you have an author's amendment? I do, I have the 824 amendment and an oral amendment to the amendment. Okay. So the oral amendment will delete uh, lines 1.20, 1.21, 1 and 1.24. Ms. Painter, can I have you clarify that for folks? We're doing 30. Madam Chair. 40.15, yes. No. We're hearing uh, Senate file 34.92 right now. Sorry, I just announced that we swapped those. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, which are we doing? We're doing 3492. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Painter. Madam Chair, members, the oral amendment to the DE, which is numbered A24-0208, page one, strike lines 20, 21, and 24, and renumber the items. Any questions for the oral amendment? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The oral amendment is adopted. Okay. Uh, now we'll move Senator Bolden or Senator Mohammed's A24 author's amendment. All in as amended. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Senator Mohammed, your 
A24 is adopted. Are you ready to present your bill or? Yes, okay. I am. You can go ahead and present the Senate file 3492 as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I want to talk about something that's affecting many people in our communities overtly complicated leases and rental agreements. In the past, these agreements were short and simple and easy to read, just a, few, just a few pages long. But now they've become incredibly long and sometimes 40, 50, or 60 pages long, like this one. What's troubling, in these, uh, what, what's troubling is that these longer agreements mostly benefit landlords and not tenants. More than half of the terms in favor, more than half of the terms favor landlords, while only small portions protect tenants. I think I have some visuals that were supposed to come up at some point that sort of show um, how these have changed over the years. That's why today we're introducing a bill to make things a little bit more fair and give tenants more rights. However, I am proposing that we focus on just four important things. Ensuring landlords face tougher penalties if they break the, the rules. Give tenants better protection against landlords who try to retaliate for complaints. Stop landlords from charging application fees, which can be a significant bar, uh, burden. Put an end to pre-lease de uh, deposits, making it easier for people to find a place to live. If we can make these changes, which I think, in my opinion, are simple and small, will be making big differences, big difference for renters everywhere. So let's do the right thing. With that, I uh, believe I have, I will take questions. Uh, let's go to testimony. I have uh, Michael Dahl first on my list. We'll go right to Mr. McDonough. Mr. McDonough, would you please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Larry McDonough. I'm a senior policy attorney with Homeline. Uh, I've been an attorney for over 40 years. Um, I think I might be the old person in the room, but I'll do a survey of people behind me afterwards. Uh, I've probably got about 11,000 former clients uh, practicing in the area of landlord-tenant law. Most of that has been representing low-income tenants, but also low-income landlords and small nonprofit landlords. And I've also been an off and on for-profit landlord of single family properties over about a 30 year period. So Homeline gets around, uh, or like in 2023, Homeline had almost 37 calls from tenants uh, during the year. And so Homeline, in my opinion, is a pretty good barometer of what's going on in terms of concerns of tenants. And uh, the, the, the bill as amended that you have today addresses some of those concerns. So the larger bill was really based on the fact that the history of landlord-tenant law is quite long in Minnesota. It goes back to our territorial laws. I'm a history nerd, so they go back to 1851, where there were a few landlord-tenant laws, mostly in the agrarian situation. And there was virtually no change for 120 years, so essentially frozen until the early 1970s where there began to be some piecemeal changes in landlord-tenant law, like regulating security deposits, requiring habitability, uh, outlawing retaliation. Uh, and they kind of came in bits and pieces, sometimes bigger bits uh, as last year, but also in 2010 and 1989. So today we have a set of laws, some of which have not been reviewed or updated for over 50 years. Meanwhile, the market has changed considerably uh, with the influx of out-of-state corporate landlords, some of whom simply ignore Minnesota laws and impose unreasonable fees and rules on tenants. So the original bill was um, really to, to, I don't think that's mine. Take a look here. It's to tell you that time's up. Oh, uh, is time up? <laughs> it is. Oh, I thought I was supposed to go through the history and then talk about the bill. I'm sorry about that. Could I have like a minute? Yes. I'm sorry about that. I thought I was kind of more part of the presentation of the bill. Okay. So there are, again, four areas. One is to strengthen enforcement of landlord-tenant laws. And so that's, that's probably the bulk of what's in this amendment, uh, dealing with a lot of statutes that don't have any consequences for violation. And so what we've done is we put in consequences for those violations. 
Um, uh, second and third, prohibiting pre-lease deposits and application fees. As Senator Mohammed said, they're a very high expense item for uh, applicants. And uh, if they are prohibited, it, it means a landlord can still recover that through the rent structure, but not billing to individual tenants. And finally, clarifying uh, retaliation. Um, retaliation right now is kind of in all bunch of different places. It's in three different statutes, and it's in the common law of the Minnesota Supreme Court. And so what the bill does is try to put all those all in one place to make it a more understandable and easier thing to follow. So last thing I would say is that when I was a landlord, none of these changes would have hurt me. Um, for landlords that follow the law, none of these changes are going to affect them. Um, as amended, we, but we think this would have a positive impact on thousands of tenants. And I apologize for going over. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. McDonough. Uh, you're welcome to stay at the table to answer questions uh, if members have them. Um, our Mr. Dahl, please introduce yourself for the record uh, and present your testimony. Uh, my name is Michael Dahl. I'm the Public Policy Director with Homeline. Um, up on the screen, you'll see an example of the lease that uh, Senator Mohammed uh, provided. And Homeline, look, this is one of the most common leases that Homeline receives. Uh, we help tenants read their leases and understand what's in the law uh, uh, to help them. This is an example of a lease that, you know, leases used to be a few pages. Now, they're, now we get these long ones. This is a 52-page lease. Pink on that screen are where we're representing the interests of landlords, and green is uh, interests of tenants. 52%, as Senator Muhammad pointed out, um, is interests of uh, clauses are for interests of the landlords, whereas 6% are the interests of tenants. That is why we need state law to correct for this imbalance. Um, that's, we understand why landlords want to protect their property. We also need to understand that tenants need to have their rights protected as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dahl. Uh, and finally, Mr. Smith, uh, if you would come back up to the testifier's table, please introduce yourself again for the record and provide your testimony. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, again, I am Cecil Smith. I serve as President and CEO of the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association. Um, I have two minutes to speak to a 22-page reform bill. Uh, I hope we can have a deliberative process, but I feel very limited in the capacity to do that in two minutes. As housing providers, our goal is to offer safe and decent living environments to our residents. When repairs are needed, we prioritize prompt resolutions. If necessary, uh, residents may involve city inspectors to pursue legal avenues to address such is issues. However, the approach in this bill risks fostering a litigious housing environment. The proposed retaliation statute requires refinement. It establishes a presumed retaliatory standard for one year, coinciding with the length of a standard lease term. This is one of many concerns we have with this section of the law of the proposed bill. Uh, fees for administrative tasks related to application processing are integral to Minnesota's housing landscape. Given the prevalence of fraudulent applications, ranging, ranging from falsified employment details to identity theft, these fees cover the genuine costs of diligently reviewing rental applications, thus helping to mitigate fraudulent attempts. Pre-lease deposits serve as a beneficial tool for both residents and housing providers. They offer prospective residents the assurance that a, rent, that a unit will be reserved for them prior to lease commencement, while providing housing providers with confidence in the applicant's commitment to the unit. Such arrangements are mutually advantageous. Despite Minnesota's significant shortage of housing units, this proposal fails to cultivate an environment conducive to investing in rental housing within our state. Following last year's landmark changes to landlord-tenant laws, Minnesota now ranks among the most regulated states in the nation. I'm concerned that these regulatory burdens may hinder Minnesota's ability to attract the necessary investments to address housing needs of future generations of Minnesotans. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, now we can go to questions, members. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Senator Muhammad. I, I want to start by saying I am very appreciative of uh, Senator Muhammad's actions yesterday. So we are 
over a year on this committee, and yesterday, Madam Chair, was the first time any member of this committee reached out to me to discuss any bill that's come to this committee that I'm aware of. And I very much appreciate Senator Muhammad. We sat down, we spent over an hour on this, and it was a pleasant uh, conversation. And I, uh, why I'm so appreciative, I, and I, I sent a follow-up email, that I, I firmly believe that we are on the same page in terms of our objective of having stable, safe, cost-effective, and dignity in housing in Minnesota. But there are two, there's, there's, a, there's two uh, sides on this that we just have to, as policymakers, come up with the best balance to achieve the objective. And again, I, I sincerely look forward to, to future conversations. And uh, you know, I think just trying to recap uh, over, an hour, over an hour of a conversation, it just came down to the reality that, that rent continues to get more expensive. Among the, the number one drivers that rent is getting more expensive is because the cost of the underlying housing is getting more expensive. Whether that be increase in property taxes, increase in the insurance on that, that building, uh, the increase in the uh, mortgage or interest rates as they have risen in the present environment, and then the cost of repairs, materials, labor. And so the, the way that rent is determined is that it's the cost plus the return on investment plus the uncertainty or the unknowns equals the rent. And if any one of those in that equation goes up, the rent goes up. And so what, what concerns me, and again, I sincerely think it's a good faith effort, but there are provisions in here that are going to increase the costs and then the rent is going to go up. So this bill is going to contribute to rents increasing. And so among them, for example, just one provision uh, is the, the inability to uh, uh, charge a, a rental application fee is what I heard. And so right now I'm charging, I think it's, it's either $45 or $65 for a rental application fee. I'm not making any money on that at all. That is the cost that the company I use to perform the credit uh, check, the criminal history background check, and the other, the other two checks. And that's their cost. And so if I am prohibited from charging that, uh, there is still a cost to run a credit check. I think the co of that $65, let's say, I think $35 alone is just the credit check. It's not free to run a credit check. And so if a prospective tenant who, who makes, who is applying, there is a cost. And so if, if I cannot charge the prospective tenant, as I heard Mr. McDonough say, that, ca that cost can be captured in the rent structure. I think it's something along those lines. But what, essentially what that means, Madam Chair and members, is that the applicant won't be footing that $65 bill because they may not ever become a tenant, but now I have to push that cost onto my existing tenants. That's the only way I can recapture that fee that I'm being charged, that cost. So rent is going to go up on my other tenants because I can't capture that cost that I'm incurring on the prospective tenant. Just one example. Uh, another example is uh, I know that there's, there is a legitimate concern on corporate large entities, legitimate concerns. But what's happening is the smaller entities, like myself, like that single mom, I have a number of, of single parents in my community that have one other home or it's the other half of a duplex. What's happening is these stringent regulations that are driving up the cost make it cost prohibitive for them. So what happens is, Either those small operations either then have to be replaced by the corporate operations because the small operations can't, can't make it. But then at the same time, there are conversations, Madam Chair, happening that are putting regulations and prohibitions on the larger entities. So what are we going to be left with? If it's cost prohibitive for the small entities to do it and the law prevents the larger entities from doing it, we're going to have less rental units when you're squeezing both sides of that spectrum. And what's going to happen if there's less units available, cost is, uh, rent of those that, that remain is going to continue to rise. Just, I want members to be cognizant of that, and that was part, uh, Madam Chair, of our, again, a very, very productive uh, conversation. So as this moves forward, I, I just, um, I, I look forward to our future conversation. And the next time it's going to be over a meal or a coffee or something like that. But uh, I, I, with that, Madam Chair, there's, 
I do have all my notes in the original, and I know that the, as I compare these two here, it looks like it's about half the size So uh, from the original. So I have not had the chance to go through this, so I can't really ask a lot of questions uh, at that point. But again, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Muhammad. And again, I appreciate uh, you reaching out and, and uh, continuing to build this relationship. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Um, I will also note that this is going to judiciary and then we'll also be back. So um, we'll have more time to discuss it as well. Senator Mohammed, did you want to respond to any of that? Or? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Lucero. That was a really productive conversation we had yesterday in a very, very healthy way. Um, I think that you bring uh, an experience that is um, very different than mine, but I think our conversation, what was clear is that we have, you're right, the same objectives and goals, which is to house people in a dignified way. Hopefully, as this move, bill moves through judiciary, I know you and I are gonna schedule some time next week over a coffee, and we'll continue to work with you through it. So I appreciate your perspective. Senator Drahan. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, I, I just wanna make a couple comments, and then I'll, I have a couple questions probably from nonpartisan staff. Um, but you made a comment about how long the leases are. Yeah. You know why they're so long? It's because of us. Just this week, we had multiple bills that would add requirements to housing providers that would have to add to the lease. Um, so every time we do something and put more regulation and, and more laws into place, it adds to the size of the lease. Um, so I, I think if this bill would go through, I think it would add to the size of the lease. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I do think, um, unfortunately, our society is full of lawsuits, and um, the housing providers are just trying to address a situation that has come in the past and probably um, with consulting with their attorney. And, and, and I don't think our role is to get in the way of someone's ability to have themselves represented. So I think that's a fine line that we have to watch out, just my point of view. Um, but my question, Chair, um, when, when I looked through the original bill and then I looked through this amended version, the 824, um, my question to nonpartisan staff, um, I see 14 times in the bill, um, like on line 4.22, uh, this section shall be liberally construed for the protection of tenants. And I guess what I would ask whoever is able, uh, to give me a little course on why we have that language in this 22-page bill 14 times. Ms. Primo. And what does it mean, to chair if I could? Ms. Primo. Madam Chair and members, that is an instruction to a court um, in terms of how they would interpret a potential ambiguity in that statute. So generally when courts look at a statute that's before them, their real first main purpose is to look at whether that language is plain and clear. And if there is a very plain and clear meaning to it, they don't really look beyond that specific substantive statute. But let's say there is some ambiguity in statutes, because statutes are written by people, um, then they will look to certain um, canons of statutory construction, as well as other parts of the statute. And so if a court is faced with an ambiguity, they will look at that additional language to say, um, you know, if there's some ambiguity, it should be in favor of the tenant who is asserting a certain claim. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Senator Drahan. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Council. Um, and so tie goes to the tenant, more or less, um, which isn't for our committee to have any more discussion on that. My next uh, question is um, line 1.19 through, uh, I guess, the rest of the page. Um, and maybe the, the author can address this too. Um, why are we 
having nursing homes, for instance. I know uh, three of them were removed, um, 120, 121, and 123. Um, but why are nursing homes in, in this bill? Senator Mohammed, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Jaham, um, I think it's because some nursing homes currently do have leases and people have to sign those. So it's also making sure that we, we like tenants and those housing providers um, are um, also a part of this process. But I do know that we took out the hospitality industry and this is gonna be an ongoing conversation as we go through judiciary. I met some of those folks outside of the chamber today and so they wanna have that conversation. Yeah, and I think Larry has something to add. Mr. McDonough. Madam Chair and Senator Drahan, part of what's going on in that section is to clarify what is existing law. So like if you look at the nursing home chapter, there is a cross-reference to 504B. And, and but sometimes when uh, I've had conversations with uh, nursing homes, they say, well, we're not listed in 504B, so all that stuff in 504B doesn't apply to us. Well, it does apply to them by the cross-reference from the nursing home chapter. So the point there was to kind of capture the other types of properties that sometimes take the position that they're not covered by 504B when either their laws already say they're covered by it or they imply it. Senator Drahan. Thank you um, for the explanation. So if, if that is the case, I, I, I think we need to send this to HHS or wherever the other stops are. So, I, I mean, I, I don't know what 245D is um, or 256I um, or 254B if that's Health and Human Services or if it's, uh, you get the idea. So are, are we gonna refer it to them before we refer it to judiciary? Because um, I, I think these could have big impacts. I don't, I don't know the cross-section of nursing homes and, and what they're trying to do here. So I, I recommend that we uh, send it to the proper committee before we send it to judiciary. Thank you, Senator Drehai. My intention is to keep on the schedule of sending it to judiciary because they do want to hear all of these bills together, um, but I will check with council and the other chairs uh, whose committees are um, listed there and, and work with them to get it to them. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just one quick question. With the, the amendment as amended, is there any prohibition? I know that I think there was a previous iteration. I might be blending bills because it's all meshing together here this week. But there was a provision, at least in some bill, that would limit security deposit to one month's rent. Is that this bill and was that provision in, in the amendment? Um, it was in this bill, but it's not in the amendment. Okay, thank you. Members, any final questions? Senator Mohammed, would you like to move your bill? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Senator Mohammed moves that Senate File 3492 as amended be recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion prevails. Senator Mohammed, your bill is on the way to judiciary. And now members, we will go back on the agenda to Senate file 4015, 4015. Senator Mohammed, you get to stay there. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I'd like to introduce an author's amendments um, before this, and I think it's the um, A1 amendment. All right, Senator Mohammed moves uh, the A1 author's amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Mohammed, go ahead with the presentation of Senate File 4015 as amended. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Minnesota's Fair Chance uh, Access to Housing Act, Senate File 415, aims to provide fair and equitable opportunities for more than one million people in Minnesota with arrest or conviction histories when they are apply, applying for housing. By creating a rental application process that focuses on relevant, on relevant factors to tenancy, the law ensures decreased housing insecurity, homelessness, and increased stability after involvement in the criminal justice system. Them. This legislation recognizes that stable housing plays a crucial, crucial role in decreasing recidivism and increasing, and increasing public safety. It helps 20% of Minnesota's population as they reintegrate into society and fi find and maintain employment and build support networks. Ultimately, the cycle of housing insecurity, homelessness, and incarceration is disrupted in con contributing to safer communities. Despite ample evidence supporting the positive impact of stable housing on, re on reducing recidivism, many housing providers in Minnesota continue to heavily rely on incomplete, misleading, or irrelevant criminal background information. The Fair Chance Access to Housing, uh, the Fair Chance Access to Housing Act encourages providers to, uh, to assess applicants based, based on relevant factors, fostering a more inclusive and supportive housing environment. In essence, this, this law reflects Minnesota's commitment to fairness and compassion. By giving individuals with past convictions if a fair chance at housing, we not only uphold their dignity, but also contribute to the well-being and safety of our communities. Housing is a foundational right, and this bill ensures that all people's rights to securing a home are protected. And I think I have a couple of testifiers with me, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I think our first testifier is virtual uh, on Zoom. Hi, yes, I'm on Zoom. Yes, there you are. Can you please introduce Hi. yourself for the record and go ahead and present your testimony? Sure, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Port, Vice Chair Bolden, members of the subcommittee. My name is Caroline Ioso, and I am the Senior Program Associate for the Opening Doors Initiative at the Vera Institute of Justice. Today, I will testify in support of Senate Bill 4015. Housing stability and public safety are linked. People who are formerly incarcerated are 10 times more likely to be homeless than the general public. In turn, people are, who are homeless are more likely to be arrested, convicted, and incarcerated than the general public. This bill will make all of Minnesota's communities safer by allowing people with conviction histories to have the stability that comes with housing. There is no evidence that excluding people with conviction histories makes communities safer. In fact, most people with a conviction in their past never have another one. Considerations like a person's ability to pay rent, ties to the community, employment, and personal references are much more useful in determining whether someone will be a safe, reliable tenant. While I could continue at length on the benefits of this bill, I want to address concerns that policies like SF4015 may contribute to racial discrimination based on a recent study of the similar Minneapolis ordinance that went into effect in 2020. The study's authors state that there was an increase in discrimination in rental inquiries towards Black and Somali Americans following implementation. Researchers at Vera agree that this finding is not a reason to reconsider SF4015. First, the study looked at the year after implementation, but changes in law do not elicit immediate behavior changes. Our ongoing research into similar laws indicates there is limited awareness of changes in law even years after passage. Further, the Minneapolis ordinance limited the use of not just conviction histories, but also credit and rental histories, so factors irrelevant to SF4015 could have produced this result. What we should take from this study is that this bill must be accompanied by robust education and enforcement. While it cannot eliminate racism, SF4050 will protect people who have already suffered enough from systemic racism, from a practice that traps people in cycles of poverty and incarceration while doing nothing to contribute to safety. Minnesota deserves safety and justice, not one at the expense of another. This bill delivers both. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ayoso. Uh, next on the list, I have Terrell Shaw. Mr. Shaw? Please introduce yourself for the committee and go ahead and present your testimony. <clears throat> um, hi, my name is uh, Terrell Shaw. Um, first off, I would like to thank Senator Muhammad for drafting this landmark legislation and the members of the Housing Committee. I am a member of the New Justice Project 
and I'm also an impacted community member. I spent 23 years in prison, and after serving my time, I was released with the hope of being fully integrated back into my community. I faced hardships with employment, finding programming that supported my transition, and the biggest issue was housing. I was released in March 2021. When felons are released from prison, they are usually re required to live in transitional housing. However, you only have a limited amount of time to live there. After that, you have to find your own housing. This happened in my case. Um, I was homeless for a while. During this period, I was desperate. Sometimes when people are left in a situation, they end up doing the same thing that put them behind bars. I have been, out, I have been living out of transitional housing for like three years. Um, but during that period, I uh, was denied um, housing on, on, over, over like a dozen times. This made me feel hopeless and unstable. And often, I'm, it got to the point where I spent like $1,200 in application fees um, just to even, just, just to be denied over and over again. Um, at the, this point, I was about to give up, but luckily, I did find housing. <clears throat> but the issue is, as a person with a background, you are forced to rent in low-income, high-crime areas because affluent communities or affluent neighborhoods do not want felons, felons living next door. Despite the fact that I have turned my life around since my release, and I have uh, reached the, 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 the middle class income bracket. However, I still probably couldn't live next door to you, and this should not be the case. I want to be clear that having a record does not mean that someone will be a problem, tenant, and neighbor. Factors like employment, references, and, and the ability to pay rent should be all that you need to secure housing. Having a conviction history does not mean that a person will commit an additional crime. The majority of people who have only one conviction, meaning that a conviction history does not mean that people with a background are going to be a safety risk to other tenants. Studies actually show the opposite is true. Having a conviction history does not mean that a person will commit an additional crime. This bill touches so many people because there are over one million people with a criminal record in the state of Minnesota. So, so passing this legislation will have an impact on thousands of families who just want the dignity of having a place to call home. So with that, I want to urge the committee to pass SF4015 to make way for those in our communities with criminal background to have access to safe and adequate housing. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and for sharing your story, Mr. Shaw. Uh, Cecil Smith. Mr. Smith, please introduce yourself again for the record and go ahead and present your testimony. Madam Chair, members of the committee, one more time. My name is Cecil Smith. I'm President and CEO of the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association. Today I'm here to re respectfully express MHA's opposition to Senate file 4015. This proposal would fundamentally alter how housing providers evaluate rental applications, imposing a new regulated process. Under this proposal, housing providers would no longer be allowed an application to disclose their requirements regarding criminal history for rental applications. This lack of clarity could, provide, uh, could prove challenging for applicants. The current draft of the proposal restricts housing providers to considering only certain criminal convictions such as arson, human trafficking, criminal sexual conduct, predatory offences or other felonies adjudicated within 365 days. However, criminal background checks involve various considerations beyond these specific categories, some of which are outlined in 504B.171, titled as Covenant of Landlord and Tenant not to allow unlawful activities. Last year, the legislature passed the Clean Slate Act, which provides automatic expungement of certain criminal offenses. This proposal restricts important criminal inf information beyond what was prescribed in the Clean Slate Act, which does not come into effect until 2025. 
Due to time constraints, I will not delve into all the aspects of the bill today. However, it's worth noting that under this proposal, if an individual's application is denied, the application fee must be returned and adding another financial burden on housing providers along with absorbing the administrative time to consider such applicants and costs associated with a vacant rental unit. Finally, regarding liability immunity. I appreciate the consideration for potential risks and damages not being borne by housing providers. It is important to recognize providing housing is not a property business, it is a people business. While alleviating us from financial liability, the provision does not provide me any peace of mind if my resident's safety is compromised due to the restriction on criminal background checks. In summary, this proposal does not make housing safer or enhance affordability. Thank you for providing me the opportunity once more. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Kali Griffith. Please introduce yourself for the record and go ahead and present your testimony. Great. My name is Kaylee Griffey and I'm the co-founder and co-executive director of the Until We Are All Free movement. We are a local um, justice impacted, founded and led community-based nonprofit here in the Twin Cities. And I'll just start by saying I've been working with individuals in reentry for close to 15 years now and the issue of housing can, remains being the number one issue. Um, it, it's the area that nothing has moved, and it's become increasingly more frustrating for community service providers to provide effective services when people don't have a place to sleep at night. Um, as someone who works in mental health and wellness with our people who are coming home, we're trying to focus on building up their families, finding where they want to go next in their life, and this housing barrier makes that work impossible. Um, it puts us back at square one. When people are unhoused, we're all unsafe. Another issue that I've seen come up through the course of the years is because the housing is so limited, what we've actually done is create this little black market of slumlords who have found a way to capitalize off of this population. That's when it comes in where they find someone with a criminal record who can't find anywhere to live. It's really easy to tack on a double deposit. And then the space that they're provided with is something that I would never in my wildest dreams ever imagine anyone paying and living in. The conditions are horrible. I have, you know, I've had houses where water's not running, but the landlords have no you know, accountability to fix it. And so on top of it, they're paying like more than I pay for my mortgage for these really low quality places. And on top of it, as was stated previous, um, they're in really high crime areas. So when you're trying to build the pieces of your life back together, it's impossible when you're surrounded by chaos. Um, and so um, I would just, I just thank you guys for hearing this um, bill today and I hope that you agree with us that it should be passed. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Griffey. Uh, Carmen Allen, I have you next on uh, the docket. If you would come up, introduce yourself, and begin your testimonies. Uh, members, I have to step out for a moment to call my kids' school back. So Senator Bolden will be chairing for just a moment. Good afternoon. My name is Carmen Allen. Uh, thank you to the committee, uh, the Madam Chair, and a special thank you to Senator Mohammed for authoring this bill. Um, again, my name is Carmen Rachel. I am a member organizer at the New Justice Project. Our organization organizes justice-impacted individuals around issues like equitable housing and employment. So every year we work with hundreds of individuals who feel the impact of housing discrimination because of their past convictions. I am also one of those individuals. I have been rejected from acquiring housing dozens of times because of my background. After having been convicted of a felony in 2014, uh, nothing was easy, but getting housing was the hardest task. I want to note most of my rejections came before even asking for mitigating circumstances around my convictions. It felt like I was denied before I ever applied. 
These rejections caused me to go through a number of horrible ordeals. After becoming a mother, I was homeless and forced to sleep in my car with my six-month-old baby uh, due to being rejected over and over again to the point I almost gave up hope. The rejections forced me to seek refuge anywhere I could and landed me in an abusive relationship, being afraid um, to leave because I had nowhere to go with my one-year-old daughter. So this bill is very personal for me. I made one mistake and deemed a liability and unworthy of housing, regardless of my ability to pay rent, the personal references I had, or my credit score. And I ask, how can you expect someone to turn their life around without being given a second chance to acquire a basic need like housing? No one should have to experience what I experienced. Additionally, this is not only a housing issue, but a public safety issue, as was stated previously. Study after study finds that people who are stably housed are less likely to commit crimes. For example, one study looking at women with felony convictions who were experiencing poverty found that stable state-sponsored housing and other economic support reduced the odds of being arrested for a new crime or violating parole by 83%. Like I said, this bill is personal for me, but it's not just about me. The Minnesota Fair Chance Access to Housing Act is vital to protect the 13,000 incarcerated individuals and their families, ensuring they have stable housing upon their return to society. I urge the committee to help me and thousands of Minnesotans like me by passing SF 4015. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Allen, for your testimony and for sharing your story. Senator Mohammed, any uh, comments before we move to member discussion and questions? No, this is a bill that came from impacted community who have said for a long time, even though we have served our time, we're back in society trying to do what we can to get back on our feet. Um, we can't get housing. And so we're trying to do what we can um, to make it a little bit easier for them and hopefully... I'm here to answer questions, but yeah. Members, questions? Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Muhammad, and, and thank you to the testifiers. Uh, this is a, a deeply personal and uh, subject topic that has impacts on, on obviously many people who've made decisions in their life, but have now changed. And I very, very much empathize with the people that you've made mistakes. Every single one of us has made mistakes in our life. And then we've changed. And when I was in the other body, uh, in committee uh, multiple times, on the Public Safety Committee, we had many different uh, law enforcement or corrections related bills with the testifiers that would come up crying on many different areas, but yet related to their own criminal history. And it is a challenge. It is a deep challenge. And, and housing is one of those areas, 100%. And when in that other body, and even I think it was in the other body of the floor, not just committee, but I've said it a number of times, and I'll say it again here. Uh, I serve a God that believes in second chances, that offers second chances, and third chances, and fourth chances. And I, and I get that. And, we have different systems and processes in place in society that also recognize that reality, like foreclosure, like bankruptcy. I think bankruptcy is seven years, foreclosure, if I remember, is three, three years. And there's other aspects where it's a recognition that you can't go on indefinitely. There has to be a, an opportunity for people to reset and move on with their life. Right. At the same time, as I've said before, uh, we are very concerned about the safety and security of other tenants in buildings. And we have to be. And where do you find that balance? How do you, that's why this is a very personal, it's a tough subject. How do you find the balance between somebody who has made a mistake in their life and has changed, somebody who has made mistakes in their life and they're really good at masquerading any potential change and they haven't changed their ways and they still are a threat versus those that are our current tenants and allowing those people in, how do you screen? How do you ensure the safety and security of your tenants so that there isn't 
unfortunate circumstances. And there is no easy answer. There isn't a formula, there's no you know, process we can come that just defines hard, rigid, here's the decisions that have to be made and here's how it's gonna be done. Because in my experience, every single one of these decisions is very situational. And if, if this bill were to become law like it is now, it would strip a lot of that ability to account for the variances that exist in every single scenario. And if you just monitor any criminal case, no two criminal cases are the same. Every single one has different elements, different number of children, different circumstances that might have existed, and the judge has to, and the jury, if, it, if it's applicable, has to weigh these different variables when rendering their decisions. And so to, housing providers have to do the same thing. And so by trying to strip that, that individual decision making away, I understand the intent, but it's gonna come with some significant unintended consequences. So Madam Chair, I'll just, and I, I have a series of questions, but again, I won't, I won't offer them all here. I'll just say I would just draw members' attention to the liability clause, subdivision six. I don't think that changed in the amendment. And it's uh, 3.23, it, it, it reads, a landlord that complies with this act is immune from liability for actions or civil action arising out of, and then it lists two scenarios. A landlord's decision to rent or lease to an individual with a criminal record who was otherwise convicted of a criminal offense. And then number two, a landlord's failure to conduct a criminal background check. Why would that be in here? It's to recognize that there is an elevated risk. So in a 12 unit apartment complex, in an individual a single family home in a neighborhood, this language is here recognizing that there is increased risk and harm could happen to, to neighbors or fellow tenants. That's a concern. That should raise significant red flags. Uh, the, the, again, I have a number of notes here, but I'll, I'll just finish with this. Again, rents are increasing. And I've laid out that formula. It's the costs plus the return on investment, plus the uncertainty, the sum of those is how rent is calculated. And that's with the current laws in place with rent skyrocketing. And so all of these bills, and in this one in particular, it's tinkering with the laws, and it's going to add additional uncertainty to the decision-making process. It's gonna lengthen the application process the, the longer a, a unit sits empty. And so it's gonna elongate that process so the already high cost of housing under the current laws will go higher under this because the, the increased burden that results. So just recognize that Madam Chair and members and everybody listening that I understand the intent, but this bill is going, among the other ones, is gonna to continue to drive up the cost of housing and renting in Minnesota. And for that, again, I, I understand the intent. I look forward to, to continuing to work and seeing what we can do to offer those, those second chances to, to good people who've made, they've genuinely turned their life around. But there's a downstream impact that's gonna happen with this. So with that, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Mohammed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Lucero. I think, you know, just like the last bill, we agree on the objective of, of the bill, which is to give people who deserve second chance a second chance and um, provide them safe and stable and dignified housing. So I'm looking forward to our conversations on this and working through something. Senator Draheim. Thank you. And I, I won't repeat what's already been said, uh, but thank you for bringing this up. Obviously, we all know returning citizens have a challenge there, and, and we need to figure out something. I just don't think this is the direction um, uh, as drafted. Um, you know, on, on line 1.14 of the E1 amendment, you have a line that says conditional offer. Uh, it means a written offer to rent or lease a rental unit. Do you have any idea what that would look like? Um, you know, is that something we have to include in the lease? Um, that's already too long. 
you know, is there a, a pre-done form that you have in mind here? Um, you know, I, it, it's more paperwork, and it, it you know, I like I said before, I my company used to be involved in property management. I am no longer involved. I was never personally involved, um, but the uh, the list of what what's included and what isn't included. I, th I think is very complicated for a, a lot of the staff that work the property management that are already short staffed and, and wearing 12 hats already. Um, so are, are we gonna set up a process to help facilitate and help the property managers navigate this new proposed bill? Um, so what, can you just go into what your, your thoughts are to help make sure that the housing providers are following the law if this bill would get through. Senator Mohammed. Um, thank you, Senator Draham. I think that's a really good question. The intent of it is to not make the lease, which is already long, much longer than it needs to be, but I think there needs to be some sort of a process where housing providers have to understand that this, if this passes, right, that's a thing, and how to do that, I will get back to you before, um, throughout the pro as the bill goes through the process, and would love to get your perspective on it as well. Senator Draham. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think there are a lot of great housing providers out there that do give people a second chance. And, and, and I know we, we did back when I owned a bunch of rental property. Um, you know, everybody makes mistakes. We've all made mistakes. Um, but, you know, my, my challenge with the way this is drafted, um, you know, we just heard of one of the property managers getting assaulted and it sounds like she died or the person died and that's what I hear from people all over the state is that they have a real hard time keeping personnel because it is an unsafe environment they have strangers coming and going um, so I, I think there's already kind of an edge if you will for people working in that industry to feel safe and safety is a concern for any employee, for any employer. Um, and the property managers I've talked to, they kind of have a hands off when they do a background check. So they go to TransUnion or some other service, and I'm not promoting any one, but they, they have an online process. They send a link to you and say, fill this out. And it's either a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or maybe conditional. So my question, if we pass this, just on how the process would work, how are these third-party vendors that majority of property management companies use gonna know what applies for a thumbs up and what's a thumbs down? Yeah. So the practicality of, of it, I, I think we need to flush out before we would move forward with this. Um, so that's all I had to say. Thank you, Chair, for the time. Senator Mohammed. Thank you, Senator Poor. Um, Senator Draham, that's a really good question. I think Senator Lucero and I actually had a very extensive conversation about this yesterday and how to actually standardize it, how do you do it. In terms of like the thumbs up, thumbs down, I think right now, like that's what the process is, right? right? And so like the goal of this bill is to say, look into it. What is the reason this person was convicted? And so under our state law, for example, if somebody has committed arson, you're not, you're not required to, to house that individual. That doesn't, this does not change it. What it does say is look into it, take a look at what, the, what are the reasons this person was convicted and based on that, um, under what our statute says, you have the right to do what you need to do, but just look into it without just like making a predetermination. Sure. Senator Draheim. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you for the response. And, and I guess that's kind of my point. How, how are these third-party vendors going to know what the statutes are? These are vendors that cover uh, the whole United States or maybe even North America. Yeah. Um, how are they going to know what statutes you're applying and what, what you aren't? Because my understanding, and like I said, I'm out of this game a long yeah. time ago, but it's three steps. So you, either they give you a thumbs up that they're good to go, the background check checks out, they don't get any details, it's all mm -hmm. privacy stuff. Mm -hmm. Or no, it, it doesn't go. 
or conditional, and that's the third one. Mm -hmm. And I assume your your intent here is to put it in that conditional, hey, let's look into this. Let's give these people a chance. Correct. Wh whoever the individual is. And, and I appreciate that. And I, I think that's great. But how does it work in the real world? How, how do these multinational corporations that do these background checks and charge the 45 to $65 for every time you use it, um, how do they know what statutes or what crimes are going to be a thumbs up in Minnesota and probably only Minnesota only? That, that is my question on the practicality of, of this. There was, what, a million people that are in this position, which, which is too many. Um, and we need to find a solution for it. But I, I just don't think it's practical the way this is drafted on how the industry works. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation it would be to put a group of industry people together and try to figure out how, how to make something work to do a better job. Because obviously we're not doing a good job uh, in Minnesota. So that's my two cents to the chair. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Dreheim. I will just note that similar legislation has been passed in New York State, New Jersey, and other jurisdictions across the state or across the country. And I'm certain that there are still application checks in New York and New Jersey that people have found ways to, to move through this. Um, so that I think we should take that into consideration. Uh, Senator Lucero, I'll put you on the list. Uh, but Senator Bolden is next. Senator Bolden. And Apologies, am I allowed to respond as well or to that question? Ms. I Ms. Ioso. Hi, yes. Um, I just wanted to share that uh, TransUnion comports with the law in Illinois that has similar, nearly identical provisions. So I think it's, a, it's definitely a concern, but one that you know, other jurisdictions are aware of and working through as well. And TransUnion is um, partnering in that. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Bolden. Thank you, uh, Chair Port. I just want to say thank you to Senator Muhammad for bringing this bill. Uh, and I appreciate the conversations that we have had about this policy as well. I will say as I had conversations in my district over the interim uh, around uh, conversations around housing, this issue came up probably maybe more than any other. It consistently came up. It is, and thank you too to the testifiers who shared their stories today. Um, it is a significant issue across the state and appreciate you bringing this forward because we have an opportunity um, to be sure that our neighbors are welcomed back into community and we know that we are all safer when that's the case, so thank you. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just gonna, uh, just respond, uh, if there are other states that are doing like New York, New York's rents are more expensive than Minnesota. So we don't, I don't know if it's a good thing to look to other states that are doing practices that, because we have expensive rent here in Minnesota and we want to do what we can to bring it down. I don't want to match what New York's rents are. So just throwing that out there. Um, Thank you, Senator Lucero. Um, I'm just gonna say my comments. Uh, Senator Mohammed, thank you for bringing this bill. Um, when I became the chair of the housing department, of the housing committee, one of the biggest reasons I fought for this committee is because housing is foundational. It is the critical bedrock that affects every other part of people's lives. If you do not have stable housing, your health outcomes are worse, your educational outcomes are worse, your job and economic prosperities are worse. It, it, it spans everything. It is foundational for our lives. Um, nearly one in five um, of people who are released from incarceration do not have housing to go to. How we expect them to be able to have stable lives is a mystery to me. Um, I, it, it's just nearly impossible. Um, so I really appreciate you coming. I share Senator Bolden's uh, thanks to folks who came to tell their stories. I think that's what grounds us in the reality of why we need to move legislation like this. Um, thank you. Senator, Bol or Senator Muhammad, do you have any closing comments? Thank you, uh, Chair Port, for, um, for those really kind words and to our committee for sort of um, 
looking at this bill for what it really is, a second chance for people who need it most. Um, I think in this committee often we go back and forth on tenant issues, landlord issues, housing provide, and um, there aren't many moments where we get to hear from people who are most impacted on these issues, and I think that both us Republicans and Democrats, um, we might not agree how we're going to do this, but we agree on the fact that everyone deserves a second chance, so thank you. Uh, Senator Mohammed moves that Senate file 4015 as amended be recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion prevails. Senator Mohammed, your bill is on the way. Members, we have one more bill on our agenda. I'm so proud of us for how we are staying on time. Uh, Senate Muhammad, Senator Mohammed, you have Senate file 3489. I do. It's the last one, you guys. And I believe you have an author's amendment. I, do. I just need a moment. Got to get my ducks in a row. I do. I have an author's amendment, um, Senator Port. I think it's the A2 amendment. Senator Mohammed moves the A2 author's amendment. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Mohammed, please uh, present your bill as amended. All righty. Thank you so much. So there is... Um, First of all, before you, Senate file 3489, um, and uh, owning a house, a home, has always been a big part of the American dream. But the American dream has always been more than just the house. It's about security, stability, and the promise of a better future for all of our families. Yet, too often, we're witnessing homes and stability being torn away from hardworking families, leaving them stranded, insecure, and uncertain about their future. This issue hits home for me. Um, just in my community, uh, Somali Americans who have saved up um, and made large down payments on their homes, um, on home, they're, I'm sorry, this issue hits home for me, for the Somali American, for many Somali Americans who have saved up money and made large down payments on homes, their money and promise of stability has been stripped away from them. Shifty le lenders and sellers have been taking advantage of my community. Well, right now, my community is fighting back, and we belong here. That is a part, we are a part of the American dream. That is why I'm proud to um, in introduce this bill today in support and support um, and show my support for um, contract for deed uh, reform, which is a vital piece of legislation designed to provide immediate relief to families looking to purchase a house. Um, I also want to name that um, contract for deed um, often is for folks who are not eligible for um, a standard mortgage, Fol folks who have some sort of a background or for religious reasons can't get your standard mortgage, um, this is how they're able to buy a home. So we know in its essence, it's a good thing. So the, what does this bill do? Expand it, um, number one, expanding and strengthening re, uh, disclosures extends the time that a buyer can come um, current and avoid cancellation and loss of their homes that, uh, and the money paid, making churning or flipping illegal, allowing for some refund of money paid if the deal fails so the buyer, t so the buyer walks away with at least something, placing the responsibility to record the contract on the seller, and creating a meaningful remedies for violations. A work isn't done there. This bill also allocates funding for affordable housing initiatives, community development programs, and targeted support for marginalized communities, including immigrant communities. We have the opportunity to make a meaningful difference in the lives of countless families across the nation and ensuring they're able to purchase a home. And we also have to make sure that those who are taking advantage of the system are held accountable. So um, I will take questions. We've got testifiers. Um, I've had many conversations with uh, Senator Lucero about this issue. I know many of you actually have a personal experience and have sold homes this way, and I appreciate your perspective. I think we have done so much work in moving a lot of people on this issue because we know 
it's a good thing we need contract for deed, but we also have to perform it so that those who are taking advantage of it don't. Thank you, Senator Mohammed. Uh, first, we'll go to Mr. Elwood. Please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Ron Elwood with Legal Aid. In the interest of time, I'll just, I think the questions will be much more productive than, than running through the bill, but I do want to say, make just a couple of comments. First of all, I want to thank the Attorney General's Office, who have been just a prominent uh, supporter uh, here and helped us uh, immeasurably with the bill. They're here to answer some questions. Uh, I want to recognize the next testifier, uh, well, he's just going to stand for questions, but Mr. Larry Wertheim, who's an attorney with uh, Kenny Graven, uh, literally has written the book on contracts for deeds. He's an attorney, and uh, if you're a lawyer, uh, he's been in this business for almost 50 years, knows this subject better than anybody, and he's really the architect of this bill, and I'll just say for all those things you think in this bill that are great, you can thank Mr. Uh, Wertheim and all those things you don't like, you can blame me. Um, I'd also like to recognize all the community groups that, that are supporting this uh, legislation. Uh, there are two numbers to mention, but some are here. Uh, Isarun, Habitat for Humanity, uh, Sakon Community Resource, uh, the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs. You have a number of letters in your packets of support. Um, and then uh, also want you to know that we have worked diligently with a whole series of stakeholders. Um, the amendment that you see here is lengthy, and but it's mostly technical, but there are some substantive things in here which are the product of our lengthy discussions with the Minnesota Bar Association's Real Property Section. I want to thank Kevin Dunleavy for his hours of help with us. The Minnesota uh, Association for Realtors, uh, Mr. Paul Egger and his members have been um, uh, super helpful. We've talked to the Minnesota Mortgage Association, the Minnesota Bankers Association, the Minnesota uh, Credit Union Network, Bank In, the Minnesota Association of County Recorders. And uh, also just to uh, finish that we will uh, happy to continue to work with uh, uh, Minnesota Association of Realtors and any other stakeholders that have any other remaining concerns with this bill. Thank you. Well, I think we're ready for questions. Thank you, Mr. Elwood. Uh, Mr. Wertheim. Uh, thank you very much. Just, uh, I'm glad to be here, and I'm available to ask questions, answer questions. Members, we'll go to questions. Senator Drayheim. Thank you, uh, and thank you for the work on, on the bill. Um, it is an area that I know has been abused for years, so thank you for, for trying to tackle it. Uh, my question, uh, the way I see it, it's for uh, a fourplex or less. Is that correct? Senator Muhammad? Yes. So it wouldn't affect any land or commercial properties or industrial properties or anything else, correct? Mr. Elwood. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Jayharm, you're actually absolutely correct. And even more precisely, uh, we've divided up this bill to ensure that the individual sales between two people, a family member or uh, selling it, a longtime renter, buying it from a longtime uh, property uh, housing provider, none of those things are, in, are, are involved here. It really is only the investor seller that we're dealing with. So we've We've sort of threaded the needle or attempted to do that where the problem is. Senator Drayheim. Thank you, and, and thank you for, for working on that and doing that. Uh, Mr. Elwood, where is the definition of an investor? Just so I, Mr. what Elwood. page is that on? Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Drayheim, it is on page... Uh, 13, line, starting on line 13.29. Senator Drayheim. Actually, it's mostly the exceptions of who isn't an investor seller, and that is to try to exclude all of those natural persons selling to, to uh, folks, uh, as, as Mr. Wertheim likes to say, folks selling to folks. That's uh, all I had. Thank you. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I was just reviewing here, refreshing myself with the definition of investor seller. And I, again, I there's a huge, there's a, as we just, we've already discussed, there's a giant line and page uh, amendment here. So I, it may have certainly changed, but as I'm reading the definition of investor seller, it says on line 14.29, uh, 
five, no more than two family dwelling units. Again, I haven't had the time to digest, so you just said fourplex. This sounds like a duplex to me, so again, I don't. Uh, Mr. Wertham. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, Senator. Uh, we, in the original draft of the bill, we did uh, limit it to a uh, situation where we had, where uh, the owner occupant, uh, and basically all this is exclusions from investor seller. So we have carved out uh, who is not an investor seller. Basically, it's an owner occupant. And at one point, we uh, had put in a provision here that if you were an owner occupant of a duplex or single family, then you were excluded. But if you were owner occupant of a triplex or fourplex, uh, we said, no, you're an investor seller. But on further consideration, I realized we treat a buyer of a, of a fourplex as a resident. And so we, uh, the, that's what the, one of the amendments here does. It says, yeah, uh, an owner occupant of a fourplex or a triplex is also excluded from investor seller. So as long as you are an owner of any of the AFCO property and, uh, and occupied it for a year, you're excluded from uh, complying with this statute. Senator Lucero. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I appreciate that. Again, I, this fascinates me. I, I, I'm one of those nerds that loves uh, this kind of stuff, uh, contract for deed and the nitty gritty, because I have been one who has purchased, and in our discussion with uh, Senator Muhammad and I, I've, bought, I've been the buyer of two properties uh, with a contract for deed. And so I won't get into all the different things in here because again, I'd have to digest with, with all these changes here with the amendment. But one of the things I'll just throw out there is, uh, and it may or may not be applicable, I, I, I would have to think about it more, but rather than in that same definition of investor seller, you have a continuous 12 month period immediately prior to the execution. Just something to think about. One of the things that I'm always trying to do is take existing mature concepts in the, in the real estate space and trying to reuse them rather than reinvent the wheel. So just one thing I would throw out there, and it may or may not be applicable, would be to have a standard of instead of 12 continuous months to have two out of the last five years. And for those who are familiar, two out of the last five years should ring your bell because it's just conforming with federal law for, for tax purposes. But again, just something to, to chew on. No, you don't, need to, you don't need to comment on that, but just something to think about. Overarching, I would just say, Again, huge uh, proponent of contract for deeds. And one of the things that I'm, I, I just want to be sure that we all understand is when we begin to tinker with this, those who might, those sellers who might consider the idea of selling in a contract for deed. I don't have any data in front of me to, to know if, if the last 10 years, who have been the contract for deed sellers? Is it corporations? Is it larger entities? Or is it uh, smaller operations? Uh, but what I don't want to have happen is when we make changes that increase the risk of those who are, would consider selling their house in contract for deed and thus make less houses available for contract to deed to buy, uh, I, I don't want that to happen as the outcome of, of changes we make uh, because there are very legitimate reasons why people would buy. I, and I'll just briefly mention them. Some of them include a property that's not financeable. Right? If it doesn't meet, if it's got certain issues with it, uh, it might be missing appliances, there might be some heavily soiled floor coverings, uh, holes in the wall, exposed wiring, whatever. If it's not financeable, that's a great candidate for a seller who may not want to put the repairs into it to sell it on a contract for deed to a willing buyer who is interested in, in doing that. Uh, the next, a very common scenario is a senior having 100% uh, equity in their house and I, it's before my time, but my understanding is contract for deeds were very popular, late 70s, early 80s. And well, why is it? What was happening in that period of time? 12, 15, 70% interest rates, right? Uh, with a 17% interest rate, somebody who has 100% equity might be 80 years old, and they could sell their property at a rate that could be competitive with market rates and act as the financer. But if we increase, if, if there are provisions in here, that increase the risk that seller may not be interested in selling in a contract for deed. And this, thus, there's one less house available or, or property. Um, there's a whole host. Uh, it could be buyer or seller, so I won't get down into all those. In my particular case, uh, I uh, 
In both cases, I purchased the properties on a contract for deed because there was a six month seasoning period between the improvements that I made and the new uh, appraised value that I would use for, for financing. To save myself close, twice the closing costs, one for initial purchase and then refinancing six months later, it was a lot easier for me to do a contract for deed, make the improvements, wait the six months, and then do a cash out refinance to pay off the, the contract for deed. That was my scenario. Um, and then I would just draw attention, I won't, I won't uh, um, call it out. I looked at the amendment here and I didn't see page 17 on the line and page amendment, but I'll just draw members' attention to uh, page 17. One of the, the items that you have to discuss or have to disclose is the, the price paid. You know, I see a lot of room in there to create unnecessary friction because the price paid, I'm not sure how relevant that is. Uh, because when I bought, a, you know, one of the houses I bought was $25,000. The reason it was $25,000, it was in such terrible condition. I bought another property that I assumed the $30,000 uh, assessment that was already levied against the property. So the purchase price reflected my assuming that assessment. In addition, that same property had freeze damage. For those who don't know, freeze damage is when the house goes vacant, it isn't properly winterized, the, the pipes in the wall freeze uh, in the middle of winter, and it creates a mess, creates you know 12 inches of, of frozen water uh, in the basement level, and mold issues or whatever. The purchase price is reflected in, in that the condition, but if I have to disclose the purchase price, why? Because it's not, that isn't captured in here and there are many influencers obviously that, that go into the purchase price. So just throwing that out there, again, there's, there's more and I'll, I'll look forward to having incorporated this line and page amendment with these changes uh, as, as the nerd I am in studying this. So thank you, uh, Madam Chair and thank you, Senator Bolden. And one thing I'll, other, I will say uh, to Mr. Elwood. So I didn't know that this was uh, uh, an Elwood uh, influence document, but <laughs> Uh, there was a bell on Tuesday that we had, and I, I had left it here, so I got discarded. Also not knowing it was his, and I wrote on there, reasonable. <laughs> and so as I, as in our meeting yesterday, as I was reading this, I thought, you know, this is not entirely in the realm of absurd. And so <laughs> come to find out afterwards that it was Elwood, I wasn't entirely surprised. So we will anyway, only bring on you there. Ron Elwood bills now. Senator Housley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Muhammad, thank you so much for bringing this forward. Um, I, being a realtor myself, along with a few others here at the table, um, having a contra contract for deed as an option for home ownership, uh, we want to make sure that we keep that tool in the toolbox in order for to, uh, home ownership to become, or to be available to folks. Uh, and. I like that in the legislation you're, you're treating buyers and sellers fairly and trying to make the um, very clear disclosures. Uh, I do appreciate you seeking me out too to discuss this, uh, the bill, and so you also know what the, the one issue is, is the um, refunds or the uh, canceled contract after 48 months, and you've talked to the Realtors Association and you have committed to continue to work on it. So I want to thank you for doing that ahead of time. So thank you. Senator Mohammed. Thank you, uh, Senator Housie. Um, I seek your um, perspective and your advice because I know you do this business. And so it's really important to me and yours as well, the Senator Lucera and Draham. And so we'll continue to work through it. Um, that's been something that has come up. It's a provision that the Attorney General, um, it, that came from the Attorney General's office. I know they've sent a letter um, for their strong support for that provision, but we'll, we will continue to have those conversations as the bill moves through judiciary. So thank you. Senator Path. Thank you, Chair Port. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to Senator Muhammad for bringing this bill forward. Uh, I'm glad to see that we are um, having a bill that addresses a uh, contract for deeds. Um, I've been one that have used contract for deeds for over 20 years. I've bought on kind of contract for deed. I've sold on contract for deeds. I've written contract for deeds. So um, I'm familiar with it, and um, I know the, the good side of it and the negative side of it. So I'm really glad that this bill addresses some of the negatives to add protections in there uh, to make sure that people can execute contract for deed 
for the benefit of both the seller and the buyer, but also have protections in place. Um, I'm glad that we are talking about, um, I know you and I have had several conversations about this particular bill. I'm glad that we're continuing those conversations, especially around the down payment refunds as well. I'm assuming that with the amendments, this is not being taken out, right? I'm sorry, there's a lot of language to go through. So I, I'd rather just ask the question. Thank you. Senator Pott, yes, we prefer to keep the bill as it is, as it moves through, um, and I will come around and have a conversation with you before we head to judiciary, as well as other people. Okay, so, thank Senator you. Pott. And I look forward to that. Oh, sorry, Chair Port. I look forward to um, those continuing conversations. This is one of my concerns. Um, there was a couple other concerns I had, but we had already gotten those addressed. It so I'm glad that you're taking feedback from uh, from your colleagues in crafting this bill. Thank you, Senator Mohammed. Any closing comments? Thank you, um, Senator. Uh, poor, when I found out about this issue, somebody had sent me an article on Sahan Ch Journal about um, that sort of mentioned dozens of families who bought homes um, and um, they, that no longer exists and uh, existed, that no longer is um, something that they own. And they still have dreams of buying a home. And the one conversation I've had with people over the summer has been, I don't want something that happened to me to happen to my neighbors and my other friends. And so um, this bill will move through. I'll continue to have conversations, but I think we've done so much work moving a lot of people. So thank you. Thank you very much. And members, I want to thank you all for spirited discussion today that also stayed within a time. That means we don't have to come back tomorrow. Uh, Senator Mohammed moves that 3489 as amended be recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. Senator Mohammed, your bill is on the way. We are at the end of our agenda for today and there being no other business, this meeting is adjourned.